This is Local 3 in your town. Welcome to another 30 minute edition of Three in Your Town where we celebrate the people, places and things that make this area so unique and so wonderful. It is nearly springtime here in the Tennessee Valley. The birds are chirping, the grass is green, things are blooming. It's got you questioning yourself, am I truly sick or is it just the pollen once again? So for the next half hour, uh, we're celebrating everything spring. We're going to talk to you how you can locally tiptoe through the tulip fields, or maybe you're just a fan of flowers in art. We're going to tell you how you can get involved in that. Also going to be speaking to meteorologist Allison Pryor about why springing forward is here to stay, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, first, though, springtime, you start talking about fruits and vegetables, your garden. Well, this story is about how an entire town's livelihood growing fruit was actually saved by German POWs during World War II. Of course, Georgia is known as the Peach State, but historically speaking, if you want to talk about the peach capital of the world, look no further than Sail Creek, Tennessee. Peach trees were more often than not planted on the tops of these rolling hills across northern Hamilton County. The somewhat steady breeze above the valley floor would prevent frost from settling atop the peach buds in late spring. A hundred years ago, this was a completely different looking landscape. By 1921, uh, there was a lot of activity going on with other farmers getting into the peach business. So much so that by 1926, uh, there were over 266,000 producing peach trees in Sail Creek. By the summer of 1926, train car after train car would depart Sail Creek filled with local product and travel north to states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. Sail Creek peaches were a hot commodity. That year they shipped over 600 boxcars of peaches, over 300 boxcars of strawberries. Each car held 384 bushel. I calculated up, if you line those bushel baskets up and formed a solid line, they would have stretched for 65 miles. The strawberry crates would have stretched for over uh, 53 miles. It was a big business. Of course, in the early 1940s, the world was going to war once again, and nearly 400 Sail Creek area men were enlisted into service, and that left this area uh, without a lot of peach pickers. One entrepreneur, though, came up with a pretty unusual solution to that problem. Uh, that's a good story. Um, so a man by the, by the name of Grover Eldridge that ran Hamilton Orchard went down to Fort Oglethorpe and talked to the Commandant because Fort Oglethorpe housed a, a large number of German POWs. And he talked to the Commandant about bringing some of them to Sail Creek to work in the peach orchards. They got them to come up to Sail Creek and put up barbed wire encirclement around a, a group of tents and things that they constructed up here on, on the railroad uh, beside one of the big packing houses and right across the railroad from Grover's. So they kept them here about a, probably three weeks to a month and then packed them up and sent them back to Fort Oglethorpe. Eventually, Georgia and South Carolina would really push their peach output. Farmers in Sail Creek simply couldn't compete with the infrastructure those two states developed. But for a few decades, this small town along Highway 27 satisfied the nation's sweet tooth. Author and educator Curtis Coulter writes about the peach business and other Sail Creek accomplishments because he's so proud of his hometown and he believes others should be too. The thing that I want to get across is that everyone needs to be proud of where they came from. And I'm from Sail Creek. I'm proud of it. Um, my family has been here uh, over 200 years. We got here before the rats arrived. And um, I, I just uh, want people to be able to appreciate where they're from. Just a really interesting piece of history. A lot of people in Sail Creek area have a lot of pride about their history, where they came from. And in the next couple of weeks on Local 3 News, we'll be sharing more of those stories. All right, this next story, I have been waiting, and I mean this, an entire year to show this story again. It is about the tulip fields at Lorenzen Family Farms. And after this story, we're going to talk about when they open back up to the public so you can enjoy it in 2022. Welcome to Lorenzen Family Farm, the Holland of Ray County. It's been a hobby farm for several years, six years, eight years. Eight years. 
we both have been working full-time jobs during this. So she's finally doing this full-time now. Uh, it's gotten to the point where we really need, we can't just allow people to come on the farm when we're not here <laughs> like we've done in the past. This farm in Dayton is typically known to locals as a place to pick fresh strawberries. But after seeing pictures of their relatives at a North Carolina tulip field, Ethan and Kristen decided to add some agricultural variety to the grounds. We were sitting at home watching Walker, Texas Ranger, and we thought <laughs> we could either we could either do that or we could get out in the field and grow some tulips. And so, yeah, that's what we decided to do. <laughs> 20,000 bulbs were put into the ground here last summer. We used our children as the as planters, so we all, we hand planted all the bulbs and Mm -hmm. uh, it was a whole family <laughs> endeavor. We, we do this about 20,000 times. <laughs> they did the hard work. Now it's up to you. You pick, you pay, you enjoy. We have everything you need. We provide baskets for you. If you just want to come with uh, shoes or boots that you don't mind getting muddy, um, be prepared. It is a working farm and you have to be able to mm -hmm. uh, uh, go through the mud a little mm -hmm. bit sometimes. This is the first year for the tulip field, and based on the positive response, Nathan and Kristen plan to double the size of it next year, and they are considering a sunflower field for the fall. All, of course, in addition to the fresh strawberries folks here have come to enjoy. Yeah, it's, I mean, it brings in everybody from, you know, two years old who didn't come here by themselves, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> to the, uh, you know, to people of all ages. Such a shame that he was so shy on camera and didn't really let his personality come through. Okay, so if you want to know when the Lorenzen family farm is going to open up their doors once again so you can enjoy the tulip fields, they're aiming for March 16th or 17th as their grand opening. You can go to their Facebook page, follow them. You can see the progress, all the planting uh, that went into what you'll be able to enjoy there. It truly is special. It's a wonderful experience. You, your family, your loved ones will really enjoy it. All right, after the break, springing forward. A lot of people, well, they don't love it, but it is here to stay, and we're gonna talk with meteorologist and scientist Allison Pryor about why it's not going anywhere anytime soon. This is Local 3 in your town. March 13th, that is when we are springing forward, like it or not. Okay, what you're about to see is a breakdown of the history of time zones in this area, and then Allison is going to explain why springing forward is not going anywhere anytime soon. Once upon a time in the state of Tennessee, there was no set time. In fact, for more than 100 years, each town determined its own time in the state. And that was essentially an elected official walking outside and saying, well, yeah, that seems like high noon. Set the clocks. And not long after the arrival of railroads across America, it became obvious that some standard time was necessary. However, uh, railroads were in competition with each other, so they didn't exactly cooperate. Each railroad came up with its own time. To add to the confusion, railroads sometimes changed the time zones they used. In 1874, the East Tennessee, Virginia and Georgia Railroad ran on Nashville time. Nine years later, the same railroad ran on Louisville, Kentucky time. So finally in 1883, all the train companies came together and they said, listen, we got to come up with a unified set of time zones so we can all be on the same page. Eastern, Central, Mountain, Pacific. There we go. Everybody happy? No. There were cities across the country who said, I don't want to be told by big business how to tell time. We are not going to subscribe to this notion. One of those cities, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Fast forward to 1918, the year that Congress enacted the Standard Time Act, making precise time an official and legal concept in the United States. So now we should all be happy, right? We have centralized time zones. All of us are on the same page about it, right? Wrong. <laughs> okay, Allison's here to talk about kind of the issues when we hear about daylight saving times, what that could mean to our region specifically. Right, so we're kind of split up, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, whole state's eastern time zone. Alabama, whole state, central time zone. Tennessee, we're split. So right. the question comes in, a what if scenario, because different states have been talking about this. They like daylight saving time. They're putting through legislation, hey, let's stay on daylight saving time year round. Yeah. 
but it can't happen unless it's done across the entire country. Correct. So here's our what a scenario because you want that consistency and this is showing what would happen if the consistency wasn't there. So let's just pretend that Tennessee stayed on daylight saving time. Notice this map, whole completely different color on there, right? <laughs> so North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, November through March would be on standard time. Tennessee on daylight saving time. So we're still on that kind of spring forward time, meaning East Tennessee, not even on the Atlantic coast, would have the most advanced time in the country. So if you were in Benton, in Polk mm -hmm. County, okay. drove east to Murphy in North Carolina, okay. you would actually be going backwards in time because oh. you would be going from 8 a.m. Oh. to 7 a.m. Okay. All right. Very daily commutes for people from Chattanooga down to Fort O yeah. in Georgia, an hour difference now. Yeah, sure. Here's the big one though. All right. Let's pretend you're in Chattanooga. Want to go down to Fort Payne in Alabama? Mm -hmm. Two hours difference because Tennessee is on daylight saving time. Alabama fell back. Fell back. Oh. They were already an hour behind us, so now they're two hours behind us. So just absolute chaos <laughs> unless the government just said everybody has to subscribe to the exact same notion. Correct. So Yes, individual states may set daylight saving time that we want it, but it can never happen until the federal government says so. That's why we bring her in. She's got the, the big brains. After the break, we were talking about Art Everybody, Allie Kay from Allie Kay Studio on Chattanooga Southside. This young woman has built an entire community for artists around the globe to come together, learn from one another, and to celebrate one another. That story, after the break. This is Local 3 in your town. Welcome back to this 30 minute edition of 3 in your town where we celebrate the people, places and things that make this area so unique and so wonderful. By, by now, you know, we love history, uh, we love science and we love art here uh, in 3 in your town. Ali K, Ali K Studio on Chattanooga Southside has developed this community for artists, both online and in person. To, to help build one another up and to expand their artistic abilities. Check this out. Chattanooga needs this and I would love for the community to know about this building because I feel like it's so new that a lot of people don't know that we are doing First Fridays every uh, first Friday of the month. This is a really amazing place to see like real art being made and, and where it's made and meet the artists like it's just so cool and to her credit ali k is bringing in hundreds of folks to see this building and spend days at a time in her individual studio whether it be in person or virtual but i just launched something new called uh, my fresh paint community it's a membership group where i'm doing weekly instruction that's live so i teach them something different every week um, so I have a lot of people that are doing that with me and those people are all over the world. So that's fun. Part of an artist opportunity is to travel to Chattanooga and take a workshop with Allie. There are 10 people in this week's class, not a one of them from the state of Tennessee. This is an opportunity, not only for instruction from Allie, but also for community, something Allie offers both here on the South side and on the internet. People are usually alone in their studio working on something and I think that's what's been really magical about this community that I'm creating online because they just are so encouraging to each other and you know we connect through our Facebook group and so I see all of like the conversation amongst people in different parts of the world that kind of become friends in this little circle. It's new, it's exciting and it's a help for those who want to expand their talents and their circle. They all they all get like that there's some struggle or so like sometimes people are not totally confident in what they're painting and they just need somebody else to tell them it's awesome and so everybody has been really just ready to do that because i think they feel like they need it too very cool stuff if you want to find out more about ali k studio we're going to have a link to it on our facebook page just look up john martin three super easy to find we have all these stories and many many more some people they love to, to do art and to collect art. Other people collect things uh, like baseball cards, concert tickets. But one couple in Rossville collect coffee mugs for a very, very sweet reason. We're standing next to uh, right now uh, 
a total of about 320 mugs. Been collecting really since about 1960. Uh, 1960, my parents took my brother and I out to California to Disneyland. This one here is 61 years old. That was purchased by my parents back in 1960. And so it holds a special place for me. And uh, yeah, we take care, good care of all of them, but this one I take a little bit better care of. An impressive accumulation indeed. Rogers collection though evolved over the years from a hobby for me to a hobby for we. You know, it's been a hobby for me, but it's also been a hobby for Sue, you know, that because we've done it together. This is memories from our marriage and from places we've traveled and things we've seen. And some of them we know we'll never probably be back to that place again. So those are our special to us because um, it will remember where we were. Hundreds of people, places, and experiences are represented in this collection of glazed ceramics. For Sue, there's one mug that might easily stand above all others. This one's from the Phantom of the Opera. We went to Memphis and saw the production there. And I guess it was a date night. And it was one of those nights where we did whatever, it didn't matter if it cost $6 for a piece of cheesecake, we got a piece of cheesecake. And, and he bought me a candle in the candle shop in downtown Memphis. And we ate at a, a special little diner. And so that night was a special, special night. And the, every time I hear the Phantom of the Opera played, I'm immediately there. And the mug reminds me of that. It's a collection of handled thought prompters evoking emotions just like a, a photograph or a song filled with memories and, well, a little irony. Well, 320 mugs, I don't drink coffee. I don't drink coffee. I like the smell, but uh, I have never, I really never drunk coffee. The collection will continue to grow right alongside their experiences together. Uh, we enjoy getting up and, and seeing where, where the next mug will come from. And uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be down the road someplace. I mean, I don't know, it could be tomorrow, but you know, we're always looking, we're always asking. A very sweet couple, not at all bizarre that they have all those coffee mugs and don't drink coffee. After the break, we are headed back to the kitchen with the one and only Claire Bear. Oh my goodness gracious, guys, we are putting together an air fried taco donut. It is super fun and, and super delicious. This is Local 3 in your town. Welcome back, everybody. All right, let's eat an air fried taco donut. Check this out. Welcome back to the kitchen, everybody. We are experimenting today. And when I say we, I mean myself, John and Claire. Say hi, Claire. Hi, Claire. We are putting together a donut taco. Might work, might, might not, not work, <laughs> might go to McDonald's. <laughs> Let's find out. Currently, we have some hamburger meat. Uh, uh, what am I talking about? We're browning the hamburger. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Whilst that is occurring, we are going to open our biscuits here. We're going to flatten them out, and then we are going to poke a little hole in them because it's a donut. Donut. Ah! Claire, those are uh, they're supposed to be round. Well, we're also making some hexagons. Okay. Can you point out which one's a hexagon? That one. Oh, good job. It's got six sides. Yeah. Is that right? You could pass first grade. All right, Claire. You've done a job here. Fantastic uh, <laughs> job is what you meant. <laughs> we are going to take our whole maker and we're just going to start punching holes in things. And there it goes. So here's where things can get a little dicey. We are going to take this hamburger that has also been seasoned with taco sauce and onion, and we're just gonna kind of fill in the bottom half of our donut. We're also gonna, what about what? Taco donut, it's kind of funny. Okay, 
And we're also going to put in a little bit of cheese as well. And then we're going to take the top and just put it on top. It's going to get a little messy. So great. Just, just. They love to clean the kitchen. It'll be fine, Claire. <laughs> Claire, if you'll get that for me, thank you very much. And we're gonna go ahead and just spray it just a little bit. We're also gonna spray the top of this donut. We have it heating at 350 degrees. It's gonna be just kind of a, a test to see how long it goes in. Okay. Guacamole, we got cheese, we got lettuce, we got tomatoes, and we've got some street taco sauce. Nice. So, how about it? I think this really, wait, I think this really speaks about our personalities. How so, Claire? Because <laughs> I don't want to say the wrong thing. I'm like, I'm just got a lot going on. Yeah. Have you met me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little, I'm a, I'm a little ADD. <laughs> really good. It's really good. Mm -hmm. Fun new way to eat a taco. I think the kids would really like it. Yeah, the adults. I think the adults would really like it. We have that recipe as well on our Facebook page, John Martin 3. Check it out, whole lot of good stuff on there as well. As always, everyone, thank you very much for tuning into this 30 minute edition of Three in Your Town. If you think that you have a good story idea, somebody we should meet, go ahead, send us a note. Love meeting new people and sharing their story with our audience. Till next time, everyone, be good to yourself and to others. This is Local 3 in your town.